And I think if we've listened to the earlier interventions, it's precisely about that. Ensure that your dreams always exceed your current capacity to achieve them. Because if you don't, you can't say, yes, we have, yes, we will, yes, we can. I thought long and hard about this topic. And I wondered how best to approach this. Because I could talk just about myself, but I thought as one talks about yes, we can, yes, we have. We talk about those who kind of came before us as well. And I looked at the fact that, you know, this year is the centenary year of Albertina Sisulu's uh, birth. It's the centenary year of Nelson Mandela, Holly Lachla Mandela's birth. But I particularly thought that being Women's Month, we want to look at the centenary year as well. Um, I also considered the fact, and I know that last year there was a discussion on Charlotte Makreke um, at Stellenbosch, and she was 40 years old when these two amazing South Africans were born. And then already there were South African women, and you would recall that she was the first a black woman who attained a Bachelor of Sciences, not in South Africa, but in the US at that point in time. Um, there's a book of hers called The Life and Times of Charlotte Manya Matreke, The Beauty of the Heart. And it talks about her journey, but the big issue was that then already, a hundred years ago, there were women that were mobilizing against the imposition of past laws being imposed on men at that point in time. And it was as though they had the foresight that this would be expanded, that if they were to step back and not take a particular position, uh, there would be an imposition that would go beyond. And lo and behold, I mean, we know about 1956, we celebrate it, and hence Women's Day, and hence Women's Month. But I think we should remember that it came before. And I particularly make this reference because in many instances, at a given point in time, when we're in a situation, there's almost a sense as though we are the pioneers. We are the first. And yet there were others who came before us. And if you go into the literature and research, and there's a young woman, uh, PhD uh, candidate, uh, not candidate, she's uh, doing a PhD at the moment, who said that as she was reading, and she was part of the 2015-2016 Roads Must Fall and Fees Must Fall movement, and as she was going into the literature, she actually realized that looking at the thinking of many of those who came before um, us, they were actually thinking, planning, strategizing in the same way. They may not have used technology, but the way in which mobilization was taken forward and the thinking, the stance, and the positioning they took was very much about what uh, um, the generations that followed had considered. And here I'm talking about women and I'm talking about men. So whether it's the 56th generation, whether I want to talk about the 72 generation, or onwards, there's a common thread. Unfortunately, there are still some battles that remain, but I'm going to talk about that a bit more. So let me share personal, a few personal stories, because at the end of the day, the personal is also political, as we say just as you indicated how the personal is political and how you pushed through. So in the early 70s, I also took an approach of, yes, I can. And it was a simple thing. I was, as you all are aware, my mother's here today. My father was a principal at a, at a school that was in Fora, just outside of Cape Town. That time it seemed very far, but right now it's just very close by. 
So, of course, we had to stay with my grandmother in a little place called Klipfontein to be able to go to Livingston High School in Claremont. I know you're going to show that five-minute thing, but I want you to hold on that because this is the first story, you know. <laughs> um, so um, we used to have the bus that started there, ended in Claremont, which is where the school was, started the journey in Claremont and back again. So there was this 14-year-old who, because at that point, whenever we got on the bus, when the bus fills up, the school kids had to stand up for the adults, for the workers. And that inevitably happened quite soon after the first stop. And there were always four seats empty at the front in the bus. And this fine morning I thought, my goodness, these adults aren't sitting in these seats. I'm going to sit there. And the bus driver then turned and said, You must get up, you can't sit there. And I said, I'm not. And he stopped the bus, and he physically lifted me out. Now you can see I'm quite tall at the moment. At 14, I wasn't much shorter than I am now, you know. He actually physically left me out, put me on the side of the road. And I had a clip card. So the clip card is one way that way, one way back. So I didn't have any extra money, and I thought... Now, this was the first act of, fizzle, of, uh, of public disobedience. What do I do now? This is 10 kilometers from school. And walking from here, I'm going to get to school late. And I'm staying with my granny, my mom and dad or somewhere else. I'm in trouble. And I was more worried about my grandparents than the public, dis my grandmother, than this act of public disobedience. Fortunately, my Afrikaans language teacher was courting his wife at that point, and she lived out in the Philippi area. And he recognized this blazer and stopped, and he said, Geraldine, what's happened? Your eyes are flashing, and I tell him the story. And he said, well, good for you, you know, I got to lift to school. The rest is history, but to say that subsequently... Um, I didn't realize that there was a Rosa Parks in the USA, and this was a big issue. This was just <coughs> Geraldine saying, yes, I can, because these adults are not sitting on these seats. But it was at a time when, if it was a double-decker bus, downstairs was for whites only and upstairs were for blacks. The two seats, the four seats at the front was reserved and that was it. But I think that was the spirit of what was around the dinner table. I was born in 1960. Many of you would recollect that this was the year, I think the state of emergency, mummy, was 1960, 61. It was the year of the state of emergency from a background where my grandmother was the first trade unionist at a fireworks factory um, in this particular factory, Rondon. I had an aunt who, when I was seven years old, was in self-imposed exile because her husband had to leave on an exit permit to do a PhD in history at the Dutch university because it was not considered appropriate for a black South African to get a PhD from a university abroad. Interestingly, Charlotte was just uh, was a period before and that did not happen. So I raise that because it's the yes I can story that sometimes it's almost a sense of disconnect when it's intergenerational. So let me jump into a few other things that I want to touch on and I want to talk about a little bit of the current period. So a few things as I thought about what should I talk about further on the Yes I Can. Should it be when I joined the ANC and this was when I was 20 years old? Should it be about when I went into exile? Should it be about being a member of Mkonto Wesiswe? and training out in Angola, in the former Soviet Union, in Cuba. What should it be about? Or should it be about the extrajudicial killing 
by a death squad, the forerunners of the CCB of Joe Kabi and me as a 20 turning 21 year old, together with another young man who was 22 years old, finding his body in the bullet ridden car. Is that the yes we can story? Or should it be about the return and the unbanning of the organizations and the release from prison? Should it be about Albertina Sisulu having been the longest serving banned woman and that's something that's not much celebrated? That's a yes we can as well. And that she was the parliamentarian and the one, if you would recall, that announced in our first democratic parliament that the candidate for presidency will be Nelson Khalifatla Mandela. Is that the yes we can? Or is it about the comment that I was part of the Constituent Assembly, I was a parliamentarian? Or is it just that I'm a daughter and that I'm proud to be the progeny of Arthur Fraser and Cynthia Fraser? That is that the yes, you can story, yes, I can story, or is it that I'm a grandmother to Batandwa Moloketi Williams and he's three months old and I think he's the most wonderful <laughs> baby in the whole world because he's going to represent a future that would tackle with the issues of non racism, of non sexism, and he'll stand up and one day say, I'm strong like Serena because I'm a feminist. You know, is this the yes I will story? Or should I talk about being a proud black South African woman born on this continent, a continent that through a Tamashek proverb says, and I quote, that riverboats came from the south, salt camels come from the north, and wisdom and knowledge reside in Timbuktu, close quotes. Because at the end of the day, when Europe was going through the dark ages, it was in Timbuktu that the first university was started. And this was where the center of knowledge was. This is where there were scholars of mathematics, of astronomy, of philosophy, and all. And we just don't remember, because we don't know that yes, I can is yes, we have, yes, we will, and that there are instances in history where you will have moments that could make you desolate about a future. But because we say yes, we can, we always say we can make it happen. And I thought maybe, yes, I can, should be about the fact that I'm an avid reader and that I devoured the works of the Amalkar Cabrals, looked at what was said about the Thomas Sankaras, read the formidable Nawal al Sadawi, and you'd recall her novel of Women at Point Zero that talks about the story of Fedos, a victim of sexual abuse, who was awaiting execution in a Cairo prison cell. And the hidden face of Eve, was this that I should talk about today? Or is it coming home to Pumla, Daniel Kola, or Amanda Hose, as we reminded earlier, where Pumla says, and I quote, while there are many feminist strands, which is to say different kinds of things of feminism, there are also many core principles. The commitment to actively oppose and end patriarchy is one. The recognition that patriarchy works like other systems of oppression, like racism and capitalism, to value some people and brutalize others is another area of agreement. Like other systems of oppression, it also requires the support of many members of the groups it oppresses, close quotes. And that's what Amanda also wrote about in the Burger. Is this the history we can story? And I think for the universities, 
and the university institutions across this country, across this continent, across the world, this is something we must consider. Because you see, to many people, feminism has become a pejorative term. And it's not been seen for what it is. And that's why you have the sexual violence that we're dealing with. And as was stated earlier, it's not just violence of women, uh, men on women. I mean, we also have gender-based violence that's uh, imposed on members of the same sex um, by others. So is this about that? Because I think we had a very sad month this month when we've also seen women who've uh, committed suicide, been subjected to rape, but because we are brave and we're ready to dream the dreams that scare us, we say we're going to dream beyond this violence because we are going to make the difference. We don't have the luxury of being spectators in this situation. We should say, what am I doing to contribute towards a collective change? And we don't become helpless victims or brave survivors. We work together with everyone to make it happen. So as I looked at the definition that Pumla has mentioned, I also want to touch on something else, and that's the issue of non-racialism. And it's pertinent to Stellenbosch. It's pertinent to the university as to all other universities. And when I talk about non-racialism, I make reference to my inaugural address as Chancellor of the Nelson Mandela University. And here I see non-racialism as a key principle of the Freedom Charter, of our, con of our Constitution, and what I believe that all the universities on this, in this country stands for, and I would hope universities across the world. But this principle should not be confused with color blindness, the post-race society, or the expunctuation of differentiated racial experiences. Rather, it should be understood as a relentless, incessant principle that animates our work against racism in a decidedly, decidedly racist and racialized society and world. Because it's not limited to South Africa. And I'm unapologetic about this. This is something that I was ready to fight for and ready to die for. And when I say this, I don't say this lightly. Because there were moments that it was clear that was there. So I'm saying this because as we remember a few months ago, and I'm not saying this in a pull me down way because I don't believe in this pull it down. I think we must get rid of that because we can differ and difference doesn't mean pull it down. There was a white woman who became the first South African to be sentenced to a prison term for the use of racist language of a nature reminiscent of the worst periods of our past. The sad reality we all know is that Vicky Momberg is by no means the last bigot in our midst. As, and this is proved true as we've witnessed in recent days. But these are just the public incidents. But it's not just bigotry that should alarm us it's the affliction of entitlement to continue enjoying the best resources our country has to offer to the continued exclusion of the overwhelming majority of citizens. And I think that is the greater concern. And if we fail to accelerate and comprehensively address power relations in our country, whether apartheid power relations, or gender power relations, we need to address that. Because if we don't, socially, psychologically, educationally, and economically, we render non-racialism vulnerable. And we run the risk of declining into the realm 
of what could be argued, and allow me to exaggerate, of a failed state. And besides failing, besides all else, we'll also fail the legends in woods whose footsteps we tread. And I think it's critical because we're not just doing it for our past, we're also doing it for the beautiful ones who are being born. So it's for the legends, but it's also for the legends yet to be born. And our universities have a critical role to play in this regard. So now is not the time for anger, and what I raise is not about anger. It's not the time for ag aggression. And as institutions, we must grasp the opportunities that real transformation presents us with its transformation as it relates to gender relations, with its transformation related to race, with its economic, social, or political. Because transformation is not about charity. It does not equate to corruption or the punishment or exclusion of any particular group. It does not infer inferiority. What it infers is the superiority of everyone, the inclusion of all. It's about progress and sustainability. It's a process we must engage and we must emerge fairer, more compassionate, with a greater sense of pride, equality, equity, and justice. And when we are done, we know that it is because it's desirable and it's a necessity. So yes, we can. Yes, we have. Yes, we will. I have a lot more to say about it, but I think that's enough for today. Thank you very much.